All right, so I'm Joe Madry. I'm an emergency physician, medical toxicologist. My background, graduated from the Air Force Academy in 2001, went to Minot Air Force Base as a bioenvironmental engineer there for three years. During that time, got to the mostly tested for toxins and then got to respond to the world's largest anhydrous ammonia spill, which was a cool experience. And then went to USIS for medical school, residency at CMC, BMC, whatever you want to call it. And then went to Denver Health for Tox Fellowship for two years. And then I've been back at CMC for, I think, almost five years now. Currently, I'm assigned at the Institute for Surgical Research as the director of the NROUTE Care Research Center. So we do all the CCAT research and medevac type research, things along those lines. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the introduction to toxicology. We're going to go through the general approach to the tox patient. First things you want to do, what you want to worry about first then various decontamination techniques when they're indicated when they're not. And then we'll go through the toxidromes, which are very popular on um, board exams for those that are concerned about that in the future. And then some specific drugs and the therapies for those drugs and then conclude. So your general approach, just like anything else in emergency medicine, it's ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. The vast majority of deaths from tox patients are airway deaths. So they take something that causes enough sedation that they quit breathing and they die from that. The next most common cause is cardiac dysrhythmia. Those are the big things you're going to be looking for, trying to treat up front. Get your safety net with your IV O2 monitor. And then an EKG is definitely one of the tests you want to hurry up and run. Like I said, cardiac is a common cause of death, so you want to look for those abnormalities. Chemistry, uh, which you're going to use if you need to, to calculate your anion gap. Do not calculate an anion gap off of a blood gas. That is an already calculated value. It's not an accurate value, so you'll come up with the wrong answer if you use that. And then aspirin and acetaminophen levels. There's been multiple studies looking at what testing should you actually do for a tox patient. And really the only thing that's consistently panned out as yes, you should run this test and you should run this test on every psych patient who says, I want to kill myself, but I didn't take anything. About 1% of those patients will have a dangerous uh, level of acetaminophen that you need to treat. So that's the one big test you want to take test for. And there's no toxidrome to warn you about that, at least not a classic toxidrome where you're going to pick up easily on it. So you want to test for that value. And then salicylate, I recommend just because none of, no one's really familiar with salicylate overdose anymore. It's pretty easy to miss kind of findings on physical exam, and it's definitely something that will kill you. During my tox fellowship, the majority of cases that died that we could have been able to save if interventions had been done earlier or more appropriately, it was the salicylate overdoses. And usually there's a delay in diagnosis in those cases. So get a salicylate level just to make sure. For um, the acetaminophen level, if it's a psych patient, one level undetectable, you're done. If it's someone who says they overdosed on acetaminophen or something with acetaminophen in it, then you need you can get initial level, but you need to get a level ideally four hours from the time that they took it, but definitely at least a couple hours because if they took it right before they got in, you could have an undetectable acetaminophen level and then it will spike after that as they start to absorb the acetaminophen. Things to consider based on history and exam are the alcohol, serum ozens, if you suspect a toxic alcohol, the drug screen. So toxicologists hate the urine drug screen. ER doctors hate the urine drug screen. It's more likely to lead you astray and cause you to make an error than it is to help you. It's based off of drugs that were abused in the 1980s. It's not particularly accurate. I could give you an entire lecture on urine drug screens, but just know just because it's on the urine drug screen doesn't mean much. If they test positive for amphetamine and they're tachycardic with a fever and they have hypotension, yeah, it could be the amphetamine that they overdosed on, but it's also a very good chance that the patient who abuses amphetamine became septic because of the lifestyle they live. So focus on the sepsis before you get stuck too much on the amphetamine. And then look for toxidrome. Toxidromes are going to be how it helps guide you. This toxicology is something where it's physical exam, history and physical exam, not so much lab tests that are going to guide you on how you care for these patients. For decontamination, so if it's a liquid they came in contact with or they have eye irritation, those are things you're going to irrigate. You don't need to decontaminate someone that was exposed to um, methane gas, for example. That's something that evaporates instantaneously. That's not something that needs decontaminated. So be prudent with your decontamination. When in doubt, call the poison center and we'll let you know whether or not it's something that needs to be decontaminated. 
Ipecac, essentially no. Don't ever give it. People will still have it. They can buy it at various stores or order it online. People will have it in their kitchen cabinet and they'll give it to their kid when they overdose on something. The answer is no, don't do it. It takes about 30 minutes to work, which is too long anyways. And a lot of times it requires multiple doses. And then if it's something where they're gonna become sedated from what they took, now they're taking something that's gonna make them vomit while they're sedated, they're at risk for aspiration. Having said that, I'm okay with self-decontamination. So a lot of times people overdose on stuff and that stuff makes them vomit. As long as they're awake and alert enough to protect their airway, I generally tend to just let them vomit and get what they have out. Activated charcoal is certainly beneficial in certain cases. You'll hear the one hour rule, which is don't give it unless it's within one hour of the overdose. I generally don't recommend that because that's based on a therapeutic dose. So yes, if you take a therapeutic dose of Tylenol and I want to keep your Tylenol level lower, I have to give you that activated charcoal within one hour because you absorb your Tylenol pretty rapidly. If you ingest 100 tablets of acetaminophen, that is gonna take you longer than an hour to absorb all that because it's such a big dose. Now acetaminophen is probably a bad example because we have a perfectly good antidote, so I generally don't recommend activated charcoal for acetaminophen because I can completely treat that. If it's something that's more difficult to treat, aspirin for example, and aspirin is known to respond to multi -dose, multiple doses of activated charcoal, then those patients I'll give charcoal to. So, the one key with charcoal is they have to be able to self-administer it. So if you are having to help the patient get it down, they are too sedated for them to be getting activated charcoal. Because if they aspirate activated charcoal, that can be fatal because it binds up the surfactant in the lungs. If you put in a cup, you, you can mix stuff in it. So with the little kids, you can put chocolate milk or whatever else you want in there that will get them to drink it, but they have to be able to drink it on their own. If they can't drink it on their own, they're too sedated. Either they don't get it or you need to intubate and protect their airway before they get it. So you decrease that risk of aspiration. Gastric lavage is only indicated if ever, which is open for debate, if it's a fatal dose of a fatal drug for which there's no good antidote. Most people will never perform gastric lavage. If you want to watch a video on it, I actually have one. You can you search on YouTube and my video will be the first one that comes up, but it kind of goes through it. But just know the risks are pretty substantial with it, and it has to be a fatal dose of a fatal drug for which there's no good antidote. Otherwise, the risks certainly outweigh the benefits. Even if it is a fatal dose of a fatal drug for which there's no good antidote, we don't know if it's the right therapy or not, but it might be your only option. Whole bowel irrigation, maybe, particularly uh, for certain things, call the poison center, we'll let you know. Um, pH manipulation, especially for salicylate, we'll do pH manipulation. And then hemodialysis is indicated sometimes. Those are all things where you should be talking to the poison center and will help guide you through that. So case number one, 27 year old male presents the ED with vomiting, drooling, lacrimation after being exposed to an unknown vapor at a train station. Physical exam reveals meiosis, pinpoint pupils, and the patient's pants are soiled with urine and diarrhea. What toxidrome is this patient's presentation consistent with? Cholinergic, Cholinergic. yep, good. And what class of agent was this a patient most likely exposed to? Kind of factoring the terrorist sounding kind of incident. Organophosphate. We call it cholinergic, but we should really call it muscarinic because it acts on both the nicotinic and the cholinergic receptors. And so nicotinic receptors, when you overdose on nicotine, initially you develop tachycardia, hypertension, and then you remember the poison hemlock thing we all learned about way back when? You, you become paralyzed as those nicotinic receptors become stimulated too long. So there's a, a neuromuscular component with the nicotinic piece, but then there's the um, muscarinic or the cholinergic component with all the fluid. So what happens normally, you're presynaptic, your body releases acetylcholine, it crosses the synaptic cleft, hits postsynaptically, stimulates, causes the electricity to go down the neuron, the nerve, and then uh, the acetylcholinesterase is the little Pac-Man guys that chew up the acetylcholine so that stimulation process stops. This is the only mechanism I know of that works this way, like norepi and epi is brought back into the presynaptic cleft is how it's removed uh, to stop stimulation. The acetylcholine, that's what it normally does. What happens is you, someone gets an organophosphate, that binds up the acetylcholinesterase, makes it inactive, no longer able to do its job. So that when the acetylcholine is released, it continues to stimulate the nerve and there's nothing to shut that process off. Common things that cause it, so in military, especially we think organophosphates, 
Carbamates are similar to organophosphates, they're also pesticides. Organophosphates can be a chemical warfare agent or it can be uh, used as a pesticide. They are very effective pesticides in the United States, very difficult to get your hands on unless you have a special permit to have that. So some farmers will have this. The overdoses I've dealt with were farmers who consumed their own pesticide. But for the normal civilian, not really an issue. You can go buy it at your local hardware store, but when you look at the package, it will show the ingredients and the percentage will be like 0.001%. So it's just such a low concentration that it's not a significant concern. Um, and then obviously the chemical warfare agents, carbamates, those are very similar, except they don't age and they're shorter acting, less toxic, but same toxidrome. Flea collars can contain those substances. So some people have heard dumbbells. That's often the acronym used to memorize it. I'm not a fan of acronyms in general, but I'm, when you do use one for this one, I prefer sludge and sludge and the killer bees. So it sounds like a eighties band or something. So sludge, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI upset with emesis, and then meiosis for the eyes. So essentially, you can memorize this if you want. What I actually recommend is you go on YouTube and Google videos about the sarin attacks in Syria. And once you see a toxidrome, it kind of gets burned into your brain. And when you see it again, you don't go through this, at least for me, I don't go through this acronym in my head. I just look at the patient and I know that's cholinergic. So they're gonna have fluid coming out of everywhere, foaming at the mouth, uh, lungs filling with fluid, seizure is, Often, especially in those videos, you'll see a fair amount of seizure. For the, the Novichok, which is the recent issue in the UK where individuals were poisoned allegedly by Russia, those individuals were poisoned cutaneously. They didn't inhale it, so they actually had very little of the sludge and actually had much more of the altered mental status coma seizure picture. And the theory, at least, is that that's because they absorb it through their skin and it didn't come in contact with their mucous membranes. So that's something to think about too, depending on your route of exposure. So most of the chemical warfare agents are inhaled. VX is typically designed to be absorbed through the skin. From a military perspective, VX thinks contact more than inhalation hazard. The killer bees, that's the bradycardia, bronchorrhea, and the bradypnea. So everything slows down, the heart slows down. Initially they'll develop tachycardia, but they'll move on to bradycardia, and then the lungs fill with fluid, and that's typically what kills them is they drown on their own fluid, filling up in their lungs. So that's what you wanna focus your treatment on. Also seizures. So your treatment is atropine, and that treats the muscarinic receptors, not the nicotinic receptors. So this is gonna help dry everybody up. So you're trying to dry up all the fluid in their lungs. It does cause tachycardia, that's okay. Deal with the tachycardia. There have been cases where people accidentally overdose patients on atropine trying to dry them up, so be prudent with it. But your end goal is not tachycardia. You don't stop it because they're becoming tachycardic. You keep giving the dose necessary to stop the fluid building up in their lungs. When they inhale it, a chemical warfare agent, as you might imagine, that is a much lower dose than the farmer who drinks a cup of it, just the amount that you're exposed to. So in inhalation cases, it generally doesn't require more than three doses of two milligrams of atropine to uh, improve the symptoms unless they're too far gone. Pralidoxime is given because, so you, atropine does not stimulate the nicotinic receptors, so the pralidoxime will reactivate the acetylcholinesterase. It basically acts like a crowbar, comes in here, pulls off the organophosphate. There is aging, which is where this bond becomes covalent, and if you remember way back from chemistry, covalent bonds, very strong, very difficult to break. So that, once that thing is aged, that acetylcholinesterase is done, and your body has to produce more of it, which takes months to do. So. Um, you want to try and give the pralidoxine before it ages. Depending on the agent, it may never age or it may age in just a matter of minutes. So depending on what you're exposed to determines how prudent it is to give pralidoxine. But either way, you want to give it because you want to free up this acetylcholinesterase so that the acetylcholine can re-stimulate the nicotinic receptors because atropine is not treating that. And then if that doesn't work, um, even if you dry them up with the atropine, you may have to intubate them and ventilate them because their muscles are going to be too weak for them to breathe on their own. So that's a big thing to think about in a mass casualty incident because how many ventilators do you have? How many patients can you get on a ventilator before you run out and you start to have problems? Yeah, it's an issue at most, even major medical centers, most of the ventilators are being used at any given time. And then benzos for the seizures. 
So you definitely want to treat the seizure with the benzos, get that under control. Obviously, status is bad for the patient. Case number two, 14-year-old male presents with agitation, slurred speech, and appears to be picking at invisible bugs. Physical exam reveals dry mucous membranes, a flushed face, and dry armpits. What toxidrome is this patient's presentation most consistent with? Anticholinger. So basically, everything dries up. Causes, so atropine, which we just talked about, antihistamines, most cases I've seen are Benadryl or some kind of plant that they were abusing that's an anticholinergic plant. TCAs are often listed, although tricyclic antidepressants cause some features of an anticholinergic toxidrome, but not like a true, frank, no kidding anticholinergic toxidrome like Benadryl would. Chlorpromazine and then our anti Parkinson meds, there's some a uh, long list of meds that can cause anticholinergic toxidrome. You can memorize this if you want. They're mad as a hatter, hot as a hair, red as a beet. Blind as a bat, they'll get medriasis. That's usually pretty significant when you look at their eyes. And then they'll get dry as a bone. So we have what's called the toxicology handshake, part of your physical exam. So put a glove on, but then check their armpit. If their armpit's dry, like bone dry, think anticholinergic. You know, in your altered patient who's typically tacky and a little hypertensive. Full as a flask, so they get urinary retention. Tacky like a pink flamingo that I learned from my mentor, so it'll be tacky. And then seizing like a squirrel. Again, how helpful that is to you, I don't know. For me, it's more helpful just to remember they're going to be the same as sympathomimetic. Everything is going to be kind of amped up, tachycardic, except they're going to be bone dry. And then um, the big thing for me is their speech. So a, um, a sympathomimetic toxic drone patient is going to be screaming at you four-letter words. You'll know exactly what they're saying, and it's not nice unless the toxidrome is so severe that they've become altered and they can't speak to you anymore. Anticholinergic patients will mumble, kind of speech is what you'll be hearing from them. You won't be able to tell what they're saying. It's actually, I've heard of a case where they thought the patient was speaking a foreign language, and it wasn't until they gave them the antidote that they started speaking normally, and they realized, no, it was just their mumbled speech was so bad. The other thing is, you'll, when you shake your hand, you'll walk in the room, introduce yourself, they'll reach up and start picking bugs off of your arm that they're hallucinating and seeing. When they do become agitated, which in my experience is more the exception than the rule, first of all, think about putting in a Foley because a lot of times they're starting to get agitated because their bladder feels like it's about to explode because they have so much urinary retention. The other thing, so it can just be from the toxidrome itself. You can't give them benzos if need be to calm them down. And same as symptomatic, but no sweating and they get that mumbled speech. And the antidote, physostigmine, so this is pretty controversial. Honestly, about the only people that give this are we toxicologists who sometimes we do it just to kind of show the cool effect to our residents of, hey, we took this patient who was abnormal and now they're back to normal after we gave them this. It only lasts for an hour, so it's a pretty short half-life, and most of the drugs they overdose on are longer. Just expect them to go back into their altered state. The two big reasons we would give it, so one, you're not sure what's going on, and before you do a CT, LP, go down that workup to make sure it's not meningitis or encephalitis, if you give them the antidote and they suddenly get better, then you've confirmed the diagnosis and you don't need to go chasing after that other stuff. The other reason, if there's becoming too agitated to manage, you can give them the physostigmine, they'll go back to normal, they'll calm down, and in general, when they do become altered again, they're less agitated than they were before and they're more relaxed and so it keeps you from perhaps having to sedate them so much you have to intubate them. You can repeat the dose, it's just repeating it every hour or two gets a little cumbersome. Contraindicated in TCA overdose, so back in the 80s we EMS used to give a cocktail of drugs, Narcan and then or naloxone, and then they would give physostigmine and what they noticed with the TCA overdoses is they give them the physostigmine, and then they would become altered, their QRS would widen out, they would seize, and they would die. And so this got blamed on the physostigmine, and so they stopped giving it in the pre-hospital setting. And for that reason, it's ER physicians do not give it in general. It's a contraindication. It's listed on the package as a contraindication to give it for someone who has TCA overdose or signs of TCA overdose, which would be QRS widening and seizures. So if they have that, it's contraindicated. Whether or not that's truly affected the physostigmine or that's just the natural course of a TCA, which it is consistent with the natural course of a TCA, is kind of up for debate. But uh, more for medical legal purposes and because there may be some risk, don't give physostigmine if you suspect TCA. 
Case number three, patient brought in to the, uh, is a 19 year old male who is agitated, combative, hallucinating, tachycardic, tachypnic, diaphoretic, and has a Tmax of 101.4. And he's using a lot of four letter words. What's this guy's toxidrome? Sympathomimetic. With sympathomimetic, just think too much epinephrine and norepinephrine flowing through your blood seam. What would happen if you overdose your patient on epi and norepi? That's what these patients are gonna be doing. The common cause is cocaine, generally relatively short acting, um, so only lasts a few hours depending on the dose they took. So easier to dispo those people. Amphetamines are much longer acting, so those people get more difficult to deal with. In the military, this becomes an issue because of the ADHD medications. People will either abuse them or they'll be using their buddy's ADHD medication. PCP, um, although that's relatively uncommon. Ecstasy, there's a long list of other sympathomimetics. They cause amped up. Um, so basically everything is elevated. Heart rate, tachycardia, unless they get super, super sick and then their blood pressure will start to drop as they become near the, near the point of death. Hypertension, hyperthermia. So diaphoresis is supposed to be what helps you differentiate between sympathomimetic and anticholinergic. However, most of my sympathomimetic patients that are brought in by EMS, for example, I had one guy a couple months ago who was laying down on the interstate in San Antonio, somehow did not get hit and killed in the middle of the interstate, high as a kite, yelling a lot of four letter words at us, wouldn't cooperate, had to keep trying to hold him down, uh, which is concerning in and of itself. He was bone dry, dry mucous membranes, but he told us he was doing meth. Everything was consistent with meth. It's just when you do meth for three days and you don't drink any fluid, you tend to be very dehydrated, and so they'll be dry instead of diaphoretic. Just bear that in mind, that exception there. That's why on exams, look for diaphoresis versus um, they're dry. In the real world, look more at their language and their behavior to determine whether which of those, whether it's sympathomimetic or anticholinergic. Treatment, benzos, benzos, and more benzos. So a lot of times I'll get calls from the ER saying, hey, I gave six milligrams of Ativan and he's still agitated and thrashing around and cussing at us, what do I do? And I say, give more Ativan, lorazepam, and call me when you've hit 50 milligrams. So at 50 milligrams of lorazepam, you can start to get some toxicity from the diluent that it's put into. You can switch to the other benzodiazepines, um, midazolam drips, if you're concerned about that. Um, or the other thing to think about too is the antipsychotics, if they seem to be hallucinating a lot. So if they seem to be agitated because they're seeing things that aren't there, then there are, cases, are reports of patients responding well to antipsychotics. So that's something to consider too. A lot of EMS crews now, and especially in the ER, when these patients get really combative. So you've heard about these cases where the cops are holding someone down, they're totally thrashing around, and then all of a sudden they go into cardiac arrest. So the theory as to what happens with those patients is they become so acidotic, which if you take a healthy person, you have them sprint all out, hard as they can for 100 meters and check their pH immediately at the end of it, they'll be six point some odd if they're really pushing themselves super hard and they'll have an elevated lactate. So these guys are like that, but unlike you or I, where at the end of a 100 meters all out sprint, our brain tells us that's enough, I quit. Their brain's not saying that, it's saying keep going because they've got too much adrenaline flowing through their system. So these patients will become super acidotic, go into cardiac arrest because they become so acidotic. And now because they're not breathing because they went into cardiac arrest, their body has no way to correct that acidosis. And that's why in general, when these patients become pulseless, no one's able to recover them or get them back. What we do to try and deal with that is prevent it. One of the ways we prevent that is by giving them ketamine. So if you give 500 milligrams of IM ketamine in about three to five minutes, an adult patient, in general, unless they're crazy high doses of sympathomimetic, will become unresponsive. Now, they, the good thing about ketamine, I am especially, compared to the other agents like antipsychotics and benzos especially, is they don't get respiratory depression. You can get temporary respiratory depression in IV, but in IV boluses, that is, but with the IM, it's slow enough onset they don't typically get that. I never heard of a case of them getting that. What you'll, they'll be doing this weird breathing thing where they're hyperventilating. They're basically taking two small respirations because they're blowing off their CO2, even though they're unresponsive when you try and examine them. And so we're doing all that to try and prevent that acidosis, especially in the ER when you got like, you know, the security forces or um, 
you know, nurses, everybody's trying to hold the patient down. If you hold the patient down, you just gave them something to pull up against. Just like you can cause your a lot more exhaustion to your body by doing squats with a 200 pound barbell on your back, then with no weight, you're doing the same thing by loading them with people holding them down. So you want to do that as little as possible and hurry up and get them sedated and calm down. Complications, so rhabdo, hyperthermia, that can definitely be fatal. Uh, MI and intracranial hemorrhage or infarct. Classic teachings more on the intracranial hemorrhage are they're actually more likely to get an uh, infarct. The MI can be due to chronic coronary artery disease because of the persistent strain on their body from the chronic use of cocaine, or it can be due to vasospasm due to an acute overdose or a mixture of both. Cocaine can cause QRS widening like TCAs. We'll talk more about that in a bit, uh, but just bear that in mind with it. Two patients found unresponsive in their car. They both have a GCS of six, pinpoint pupils, respiratory rate of six, and they're developing cyanosis. What toxidrome is this most consistent with? Opioid. This is the biggest killer in the United States by far right now as far as tox cases are concerned. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. They develop respiratory depression, altered mental status. They die from hypoxia. <clears throat> and this is why we're starting to give Narcan a lot more again in the EMS setting is to deal with these. These patients actually seldom present to the emergency department because they're usually found dead. When they do present, you give Narcan or intubate them. If they are intubated, I recommend against giving them Narcan, naloxone, because if you give them naloxone with a tube down their throat, they're going to wake up and they're going to start trying to rip that tube out and they run the risk of aspiration. There's two therapies for opioid overdose. One is an endotracheal tube and the other is naloxone. Just pick one and go with it. You can, with fentanyl especially, you can require super high doses of naloxone, up to 10 mil. If you have no response after 10 milligrams, it's not an opioid toxidrome. It's something else that has them sedated. The other thing is if they go from unresponsive to wiggling around a little bit, that's not consistent with an opioid toxidrome. That's consistent with their own endogenous opioid. A runner's high is caused by endogenous opioids, and you can take away a runner's high by giving them naloxone. We all have endogenous opioids, and if you take that away when we're in a coma from what it like cyclobenzaprine or whatever else we overdose on, we'll start to wake up a little bit, but we won't like wake up and start screaming at you for ruining our heroin high. So that's what you're expecting. Don't give more naloxone than you need to because you just create a combative patient who's now vomiting and making things difficult. Uh, you see all the different morphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone. There's tons of different ones out there. We've talked about that stuff. Some old school things to kind of know about. We don't really deal with it. Propoxyphene got pulled off the market because it causes sodium channel blockade, which causes QRS widening and seizures similar to TCAs. And then meperidine, very, I don't, I haven't seen it used in forever. I don't know if you guys have, but it used to be used much more often. It used to be one that patients would come into the ER asking for by name. That's been generally replaced by Dilaudid. And um, it can cause seizures and the meiosis is less prominent. So n mostly relevant for board exams, not seen that much anymore. Opioid withdrawal syndrome, so as if you give them too much Narcan, or classically they present to the ER kind of with these vague abdominal diarrhea complaints, and then after you do a giant workup, the patient finally admits to you, well, yeah, the problem is, is that I ran out of my Oxycontin and I'm withdrawing. Bombing, diarrhea, abdominal pain, they can give medriasis, yawning, and then the piloerection is supposed to be, is one of the more classic findings you'll look for. But in general, when you have the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea patient, something just seems a little off, I tend to ask them about, hey, did you run out of your opioid and is that the problem? And a lot of times they're actually pretty honest about it and say what the issue is. It's not life-threatening, so there are some fatal withdrawal syndromes. This is not one of them. Can't kill them. It may wake them, wish they were going to die, but it can't kill them. Treatment, benzos, clonidine, and then a lot of places now are starting to give buprenorphine naloxone combination known as suboxone by trade name. There's a lot of clinics opening up for this now too since we have this huge opioid epidemic. There's a lot of people needing treatment. The one thing to know about this is if this is a partial agonist, the buprenorphine, so buprenorphine can cause a withdrawal syndrome when you give it. The naloxone will not because it's given orally and naloxone is not absorbed through the GI tract. So this is just to prevent people from crushing up the pill and injecting it. Although some patients have still done that, knowing they're going to feel like horrible for an hour with the naloxone, and then after that their high will kick in. Acetaminophen, this is by far the most common overdose we see in the emergency department that is potentially dangerous. Acetaminophen is metabolized to NAPKE. 
and that causes a central nobar necrosis. Comes in four different stages in general. Stage one, nausea and vomiting. Stage two, they feel better, they look okay, but if you check their lab work, you'll see things are not going well, their LFTs are starting to rise. In phase three, they go into hepatic failure, and phase four is either recovery from that hepatic failure, which if they do recover, they make a full recover with their liver function. So their liver will go back to normal functions. You can dose your medications just like you would as if they had never injured their liver to begin with, or they'll die. Those are the two options. For acute overdoses, you'll use the RUMAC nomogram, and the number, if you want to memorize it at four hours, their level needs to be less than 150 milligrams per liter. That's the threshold at four hours. And then for repeat super therapeutic ingestion, so this is grandma has tooth pain and she's been taking six grams of acetaminophen a day for the last week, and you're concerned she might have a chronic overdose, you'll check acetaminophen level and LFTs. Both of these need to be normal to rule out a chronic overdose. So if both those come back normal, you're done. They will not go on to develop liver failure. This is the nomogram. Basically what happened is they looked and like, hey, people above this point, they all died. People below the line, they all lived after they overdosed on acetaminophen. The initial line was supposed to be at 200, but the FDA wanted a more conservative value, so they dropped it down to 150. Treatment is NAC, acetylcysteine. The dose, it can be given PO. Most facilities don't carry PO anymore, but if you do have the PO form, you can give that. It doesn't smell very good, so put in a cup with a straw that'll help patients to take it. You give 140 mg per kg and then 70 mg per kg Q4 hours times 17 doses. IV is generally what's used now, so 150 milligrams per kilogram IV. And then the important thing when you write your order is do not make the mistake of saying 50 milligrams per kilogram per hour. It's 50 milligrams per kilogram over four hours. Or what we did in my fellowship was we always wrote 12.5 milligrams per kilogram per hour because this given 50 milligrams per kilogram per hour as an accident is uh, this is a case of a fatal overdose of NAC due to that. So, and then after that, 6.25 milligrams per kilogram per hour. Same treatment for pregnant, alcoholics, extended release tabs, chronic overdose, doesn't matter. Same treatment for all those patients. And then follow their glucose if they're really sick. If they're starting to go into liver failure and they become altered, it's one of two things becoming altered. Hepatic encephalopathy, which is certainly expected if they got a big enough overdose and they didn't get the knack in time. But do check a glucose because they can become altered because their liver's not working anymore, they're not uh, generating enough glucose and their serum for them to use. So check a glucose and see if you need to give them glucose. Consider transplant if their pH is less than 7.3 or if they have an IR greater than 6.5 and a creatinine greater than 3.4 and grade 3 or 4 encephalopathy, which is essentially coma or near coma. And then if they have a lactate greater than 3.5. If they meet any of those, then they should be considered for transplant. Call the poison center. They will let you know whether or not they're a candidate for a transplant and what facilities can do a transplant. Yeah? So if you can get a level back within eight hours of when they overdose on the acetaminophen, do not give them anything until you have a level and then plot that level. If they cross the line, treat them. If they don't, don't treat them. If you cannot get a level back within eight hours, so eight hours is the magic mark based on a study. If you can't get the level back by then, then go ahead and give them the initial dose of NAC while you're waiting for the lab work to come back. Salicylates, this one gets missed a lot just because we're not used to it anymore. Aspirin, oil of wintergreen, Pepto-Bismol has salicylate in it. It's a weak acid, and it's a direct respiratory stimulator, so it causes hyperventilation by stimulating the respiratory center of the brain, which is actually protective against the toxicity. And then it uncouples oxidative phosphorylation. Early on, they get a respiratory alkalosis, so they're hyperventilating because it stimulates that center, and then oftentimes they'll complain of tinnitus or hearing loss. Uh, probably about half the salicylate cases I was consulted on, I couldn't get a history from because they couldn't hear me talking to them. We had to write stuff down because their tinnitus or hearing loss was going on. Uh, usually with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Later on, they'll go from this respiratory alkalosis to an anion gap metabolic acidosis with the you know, combination of those two. Hyperthermia is a very late finding and essentially preterminal. They're about to die. 
they get CNS toxicity, so start to become, usually it's more agitated and then they become altered. This is very concerning because salicylate in the brain is what kills them. So if they start showing neuro symptoms, that's extremely concerning. And then they do classically get a hypokalemia, which you want to give them some potassium to treat with that. Treatment, multi-dose activated charcoal actually works for this. Exact mechanism, don't worry about it. Just you can give them multiple doses of activated charcoal every two to four hours, give them another dose of activated charcoal to help keep absorbing it. The antidote, if you will, which is not really a true antidote, is sodium bicarb. That increases the urinary excretion and it also keeps their pH elevated. And by keeping their pH elevated, you keep the salicylate in the serum and keep it from crossing the blood brain barrier. When they become more acidotic, more of that salicylate is able to cross the blood brain barrier. So you want to avoid that. Where that's classically a huge issue is if so. Most of these patients you don't need to intubate, but if they co-ingested on something where they're too sedated to hyperventilate, or if they're becoming so sick that they, they're starting to lose neurologic function, you need to intubate them. If you put them on normal ARDSNET protocol settings, you're not giving them near enough hyperventilation to continue to blow off the CO2 and keep them from becoming acidotic. And these patients' pH will plummet when you intubate them and put them on normal vent setting. Avoid intubation if you can, but if you need to, make sure that you're using larger tidal volumes and hyperventilating them to blow off that CO2. Check very frequent blood gases, and if they do need to be intubated, they need to be also getting to dialysis immediately. Indications for dialysis, so they have CNS symptoms, renal failure because their kidneys aren't going to eliminate if they're renal failure, end organ damage, and acute overdose, a level grade 100, and chronic levels of 60 to 70, depending on which reference you look at. For the sodium bicarb, so generally I say three amps of bicarb in a liter of D5W, run it at 200 an hour, and provide them potassium to supplement their potassium. I don't expect you to memorize that. When you have this case, call the Poison Center and we'll walk you through it. 30-year-old with history of depression, arrives unconscious. She is endotracheal intubated and there are no focal neuro findings. She is tachycardic and hypotensive. EKG shows a QRS of 140. What therapy should you administer to her? This is much more common in the 1980s. These drugs have kind of made a comeback, but not as much, not as high of a dose. You know what it is? Tricyclic antidepressants, good. The big thing to watch out for them with the QRS widens. QRS, you know, is normally less than 100. Greater than 100, you worry about this toxicity. Greater than 120, you start to worry a lot about this toxicity. So when you block the sodium channels of the brain, it causes seizure. When you block the sodium channels of the heart, it causes QRS widening and VTAC. And as you might imagine, so when you block them in the brain, the patient seizes, that drops their pH. Dropping the pH increases the affinity for the TCA for the sodium channel, which further widens out their QRS and leads them to VTAC. Classically, the story is they seize, the nurse yells for the doctor because the patient's seizing, doctor runs in the room, patient goes into VTAC and dies when the doctor gets in the room. And this usually is pretty quick. So these patients generally die about three hours after their overdose, not like some of the other ones that are more delayed. So the antidote for these patients is sodium bicarb. The sodium channel is blocked. You're going to try and overcome that by giving them more sodium. And also the bicarb helps increase the pH. That helps decrease the affinity for the TCA. Mechanism is, they, it causes a bunch of different symptoms, but the one we worry about is this sodium channel blockade. Like I said, they get anticholinergic features, but not true anticholinergic syndrome. They can get hypotension from the alpha blockade, seizure from the GABA in addition to the sodium, and then long QT, although you don't typically worry about these patients going into torsades because they become tachycardic and that's protective against torsades. Wide QRS is really what you're looking for. That's why you get your EKG on your tox patients. And this terminal R and AVR. In general, people don't pay a, a lot of attention to AVR. There are actually a few like indications of MI and stuff that show up that we need to be aware about, but most people don't pay too much attention to it. This is what AVR normally looks like. A whole bunch of Q, a little bit of R. If you just memorize that image, burn it in your brain, every time you look on a, you have talk, you have an overdose patient, you look at their EKG, you make sure it looks like that. If it doesn't look like that, worry about something else. This is that terminal R and AVR. Instead of being all Q with a tiny R, it's actually some pretty significant R wave there. So that's an indication of toxicity. Also a QRS wider than 100 to 120, kind of depending on your patient's history. It gets complicated. So this looks a lot like a right bundle branch block, 
So it gets a little confusing in patients who have a history of right bundle branch block or you don't know if maybe they do. One way to kind of help you tell is in right bundle branch block, the QRS should still be really narrow, whereas the QRS starts widening out more with, um, and especially the Q component with overdoses. But if you see something like this and it's an overdose case, I would just, you can always just give some bicarb. And if it narrows down after you give them bicarb, you confirm that you have sodium channel blockade. So this is a case, you can see big, wide QRS dysrhythmia going on here. They gave a dose of bicarb. Now we have mostly Q, a little bit of terminal R and AVR, and then they get more bicarb, and now that terminal R and AVR is completely gone. That's what you'd expect in the response to that. If you can't give them any more bicarb because their sodiums become too high, or sorry, their uh, pH has become too high, so pH is like 7.5, 7.55, then you can give them hypertonic saline to give them more sodium. And if that doesn't work, you can give them lidocaine. Lidocaine is a sodium channel blocker, and that's why it does cause seizures and cardiac dysrhythmia. But it has a, it dissociates faster from sodium channels than TCAs do. So essentially what you're doing is you're giving a less toxic poison to compete against the more toxic poison. Um, I have had to use that before for a citalopram overdose who did respond well. IV fluid impressors, if need be, uh, do not give intralipids. So this is kind of one of the more modern antidotes. People are trying it for anything and everything. There's animal studies that show they do worse if you give them intralipids. So at least for now, until we have more evidence, I recommend against it. And then give them seizure for uh, benzos for seizures. And you want to get those seizures under control immediately because that's going to make them at higher risk for going into the VTAC if they're seizing. Toxic alcohols. In general, I will say, first of all, with toxic alcohols, the majority of the time I get consulted and they say, hey, we think it might be a toxic alcohol. The vast majority of the time it's not a toxic alcohol. It's actually usually alcoholic ketoacidosis. Patients will, they're alcoholics, they drink every day, they get sick with some kind of gastritis or pancreatitis or something, so they quit consuming their alcohol. And so their blood alcohol drops down, they get sick, they consume a bit more alcohol, so now their alcohol is somewhere around 100, give or take a bit. And then they check their labs and they've got an acidosis. Well, it's a ketoacidosis. Um, it is an anion gap metabolic acidosis, but it's not typically a toxic alcohol. I can't guarantee it's not, so you still need to work them up. But remember that ethanol is the antidote for toxic alcohol. So if they have a blood alcohol of greater than 70 and they have an anion gap metabolic acidosis, the only way for that to be a toxic alcohol is they to ingest a toxic alcohol metabolize it so it started developing the acidosis and then go and drink alcohol after that, which has happened but is not that common. Think horses before you go chasing down zebras. Ethylene glycol, antifreeze, uh, this actually becomes an issue downrange so military members who are alcoholics will get deployed. They won't be able to get their hands on their toxic, toxic al or their normal alcohol so they'll go reaching for something else. It's metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to toxic and aldehyde dehydrogenase to um, form glycolic acid and oxalate. You think of these co uh, calcium oxalate crystals in the kidney leading to renal failure, and then they'll get the metabolic acidosis. So the toxidrome, they're inebriated, they'll get the acidosis, hypocalcemia, and go on to renal failure. And then from there, they can either die more acutely because the acidosis gets so bad or they die from renal failure. Although if you provide dialysis and good supportive care, they'll generally improve their renal function and survive. Treatment is, the antidote is either ethanol or fomepazole. And the reason you give these is because the alcohol dehydrogenase has a higher affinity for these than for the toxic alcohols. So you're just giving them something else to metabolize instead of the toxic alcohol. You can dialyze it off in general with ethylene glycol. It's metabolized pretty quickly by other means. So most of those patients, if we put them on fomepazole or ethanol, and you always want fomepazole if you can because it's much easier to dose and they don't get drunk off of it. But there is a shortage of fomepazole, so we've had to resort back to ethanol. That becomes problematic because some patients know this and they'll say they overdose on antifreeze, so they get their free ethanol drip. It's very difficult to manage these because everyone's metabolism is so different. There's no fixed dose of this. It's an infusion you got to adjust based on their blood alcohol. So if at all possible, go with fomepazole. That's dose Q12 hours IV. So in general, we don't have to dialyze these people unless they're too acidotic or if they have kidney failure. If they have reached those points, then we need to go ahead and dialyze that to correct the kidney failure and to correct the acidosis. And you can give thiamine and B6 to stimulate some of the other mechanisms of metabolism. Don't worry about memorizing those. Methanol, 
You get that windshield washer fluid, sterno cans, also in moonshine when it's not produced correctly, that's what they get. You'll hear about outbreaks of like 50, 60 people suddenly blind and another 20 dead in, seems like most cases are in India and North Africa. And this is where people are trying to make moonshine but screwing something up or they know they screwed it up and they just want to make money anyways. And so people are try trying to consume alcohol but are accidentally ingesting methanol. It's metabolized to formic acid. Inhibits cellular respiration, they gain anti-gap metabolic acidosis, and it concentrates in the vitreous humor and optic nerve is why they get the blindness. Usually the blindness is described as a snowstorm, or for those of us who are old enough, back in the old TVs where if you've turned into a channel where there was no channel, you just got this static screen thing going on, that's kind of what they report as far as what they're seeing. If you're really good at your ophthalmologic exam, you can pick up the disc hyperemia and papilledema. Treatment, again, ethanol or fomepazole. When you get them fomepazole, the half-life can go up to 50 hours, which is a really long stay in the hospital. So on almost all of these, we'll consult nephrology to dialyze them just to hurry up and get the toxic alcohol out. You don't have to, but it shortens their hospital stay from a week down to a day or two. And you can get full aid too. Isopropanol, there was this one lady in Denver when I did my fellowship who always got called because she would be found unresponsive on the bathroom floor at the fast food joint across the street from the hospital. And she was drinking the hand sanitizer, which was isopropyl alcohol. The classic thing is they'll get an osmolar gap. So all the other toxic alcohols, you consume it, you get an osmolar gap, then you metabolize it and it becomes an anion gap metabolic acidosis as you convert it from an osmol to a uh, acid. In these cases, it's not metabolized. It's only metabolized to acetone by, by alcohol dehydrogenase. They don't metabolize it any further, so they don't get the anion gap metabolic acidosis. They just get usually pretty profound CNS depression. They get drunk and then they get really sedated. They will have an osmolar gap. One other thing to mention with osmolar gap, if you're fact, if you're calculating that for some reason, like you're concerned, they said I drank, I don't, I'm not saying you check it on everyone, but if they said I drank ethylene glycol and you calculate an osmolar gap, remember that ethanol has to be factored into that equation. So you need to get a blood alcohol to put that into the equation too. The, the equation we all memorize in medical school doesn't have the ethanol in it and so you need to add that. And then GI bleed is classically reported. How legitimate that is as far as a true issue of isopropyl alcohol versus that's just what alcoholics tend to get is GI bleeding is unknown. But And then supportive care and give them the thiamine since they probably have pretty severe alcoholism. Low and slow. In general, if you have a patient who's bradycardic and hypotensive, there's three big causes to think about. Cardiac, so they have an actual cardiac dysrhythmia or they're having an inferior MI or something along those lines. Electrolytes, particularly hyperkalemia. So some patients will get the classic T wave changes, but some patients won't and they'll just get a bradycardia or they'll just start skipping beats on their EKG. That can be a sign of hyperkalemia. And then besides the uh, MI, uh, the cardiac and the electrolytes, the next thing to think about is tox. And when you think tox, there's really four big ones to think about. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, which is used to be less in favor, but the cardiologists seem to be bringing it back and it's kind of making a comeback. And then clonidine. With beta blockers, you get your cardiovascular. You can get beta 2 stimulation, which is supposed to cause pulmonary issues and inhibit gluconeogenesis. You know, I've seen lots of asthmatics who are on beta blockers, and I have not ever seen a case that, that seems to be having exacerbation due to the beta blocker, but that's taught in a lot of the textbooks. Classically, they'll come in with bradycardia and hypotension, and then the textbook will say hypoglycemia, although I will say that in adults, we generally don't see that. They maintain a normal glucose. I've actually never seen a case of beta blocker overdose that had hypoglycemia in an adult. Pediatric cases, I've seen it, so be more concerned about it with pediatric cases. But adult, I don't typically see it. Propranolol is a big one to know about because it causes sodium channel blockade. So like TCAs, you get your widened QRS, you get seizure, and you get VTAC. This is the most dangerous to over beta blocker to overdose on. Treatment, there's no perfect antidote, so it's really a laundry list of things we throw at them. In general, the textbook will tell you to go from the top of the list, working your way down. I personally tend to jump to the pressors very quickly because it's easy to do 
and all these other ones don't work great. They work somewhat, but they have tachyphylaxis, so glucagon, tachyphylaxis, so the first dose works pretty well. Second dose works a little bit. Third dose doesn't do anything, and most facilities by, are completely out of it by then after you've given the third dose. The dose is 5 to 10 milligrams, so it's a big dose, and that causes vomiting, so just be ready for that. You can give atropine and calcium. Don't get too aggressive with the fluid. They have a very poor cardiac output. And so if you keep trying to correct their blood pressure by giving them more and more fluids, they're going to develop congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, and most of the cases I've had that have died typically die about three days after the admission in florid pulmonary edema and cardiac failure. So give them some <laughs> fluid, maybe a liter or two, but don't go crazy with it. Uh, again, the pressors, most beta blocker overdoses, you can get them through with a presser. Uh, calcium channel blockers are more difficult. You can do high dose insulin euglycemic therapy. It's a huge dose of insulin, 70 units of insulin is the loading dose, and then one unit per kilogram per hour drip, so it's a huge dose, way more than you typically give for a DKA. It's 10 times what you would normally give for DKA. It sounds ridiculous. You can actually titrate that up another tenfold. Just call us at the Poison Center, we'll walk you through it. If you have to put them on pressors, call your pharmacy and tell them you want this high dose insulin because it's gonna take a while to mix this and it takes about an hour from when you start this before it has significant effect. Intralipid, uh, there are case reports of that working well. Pacing, although remember the issue is that every single cell in their heart is poisoned. So pacing may not overcome that. It's worth a shot. I've had one patient respond well to it. All the other patients did not respond to the pacer at all. And I'm not saying don't try it. Just know that don't expect it to be miraculous. ECMO is really the ideal therapy. If you can get them on ECMO, because this is the perfect ECMO patient, because they have a completely reversible condition that will be gone in three days if you can just get them through it by keeping their heart functioning. And the propranolol, if they widen out their QRS, treat them with sodium bicarb and the other stuff we talked about with TCAs. Calcium channel blockers, same essentially. The difference is, is they will get hyperglycemic. I won't go into the details of why, but classically they have a glucose in the two to three hundreds. So if you have a bradycardic hypotensive patient, check their D-stick. If it's in the three hundreds, that's probably a calcium channel blocker. Treatment is very similar, except minus the glucagon. You could still give it if you want, but I don't recommend it because of the vomiting issue. Pressors, these are more difficult to treat. They're easier to deal with the high dose insulin euglycemic therapy because they're already hyperglycemic and they will stay hyperglycemic despite the fact you gave them this huge dose of insulin. When they start developing hypoglycemia, that's actually a good marker that they've started to metabolize most of the calcium channel blocker off and you can start pulling back your therapies. And again, ECMO, the ideal ECMO patient. Digoxin, I actually saw this plant here during my visit to Japan, which was cool for me in a dorky toxicologist kind of way. But so digoxin's making a comeback, and then foxglove, old yellow oleander, those are kind of some of the plants people can ingest. It blocks the sodium potassium ATPase pump, and that's kind of the big thing they like to ask for on exams. Increases vagal tone. They tend to get more bradycardia and less hypotension compared to the other ones. They will eventually get hypotension, but bradycardia is more common, and the dysrhythmias. On your EKG, you're looking for dig effect, blocks, slow AFib, that's pretty classic. And a lot of times, too, people will think it's slow AFib, but when you actually pace out the QRX complexes, you'll realize they're actually in a third degree heart block with AFib. So look for that, too, because that's actually an indication for the antidote. Sometimes they'll complain of halos and blurred vision. Don't bank on that. A lot of times, most of the cases I've seen, it's the little old lady who feels weak and her heart rate's a bit slow, and you check her lab work and her dig level's elevated. Classically, EKG, you see Salvador Dali's mustache. This is a sign of dig effect, not dig toxicity. So this, this just means they're taking dig. It doesn't mean you need to give them the antidote based on that finding alone. This bidirectional VTAC, this is pathognomonic for dig. I've never seen it. it. I've only seen it in textbooks and on the internet. I don't know any toxicologists who have seen it. I'm sure there are some out there, but usually you get the more like the slow AFib and the other heart blocks. But if you see this, especially on a board exam, this is dig. Uh, lab, so digoxin level, first of all, it takes about six hours, six to eight hours for your body to distribute the digoxin. So if you if they took a dose right before they came in, that level is going to be falsely elevated because it hasn't distributed. Don't treat based on that level alone. Look for the symptoms. If it's an acute overdose, the big thing to look for is not so much the dig level, 
is just look at this potassium. So when they block that sodium ATPase pump in an acute overdose, not a chronic, in acute overdose, they block all of them, including the ones in the skeletal muscle, and that causes your potassium to become elevated. So there's a fascinating old study where all the patients who had potassium less than five survived, all the patients that had potassium greater than 5.5 died, and everyone in between was a 50-50 shot. So that's really the lab you want in an acute overdose. In chronic overdoses, they'll actually have hypokalemia, and the hypokalemia is a problem. So you may actually need to give them potassium. You want a potassium before in a chronic overdose. The treatment is digibine, acute overdose, give them 10 vials. Don't worry about reversing the dig effect. You, you, there are other ways for you to treat their congestive heart failure, just eliminate DIG from the table. And then chronic, give them one to two vials, maybe three. There are all these different equations you can use. Call the Poison Center will help you with the equations. But if you just, even when you do the equations, they almost always come out to this, is how much you should give. And then don't give calcium for hyperkalemia, the whole stone heart effect, the idea if you give a dig overdose patient calcium, you cause their stone, their heart to turn to stone and they suddenly die based off of one study. How legitimate that is is very open for debate, but since there's lots of other ways to deal with this, just don't give it for the hyperkalemia. Isoniazid, the big one to know for this is so that just know if you have a seizure, if they overdose on they tell you, fine, that's great, that's helpful. But if you have seizure status that is not responding to benzos, and you suspect overdose, think isoniazid. Because they have an inhibition of B6 formation, which is necessary for GABA, they don't have enough GABA, so they'll get these intractable seizures. You still need to give them benzos, but you give them benzos plus the pyridoxine. So one gram per gram ingested, or five grams empirically. This becomes an issue. I had a case in Kansas that uh, I was called on where we gave five grams, they were known isoniazid, they would get five grams, they were still seizing, gave another five grams. I told them we'll give them five grams more and we used up all the all of it in the hospital, so there was none available. Just know about that if they're overdosed on isoniazid, you may, do, you know, depending on your travels across the world, you may be in locations where this drug is much more common than it is in the United States. Cyanide, basically it's on the test exam, it's always in a fire or it's a suicidal lab tick. In my real life experience, most of my patients that have overdosed on this have ordered it online. That's how they've gotten their hands on it. It uncouples mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. They get hypertension, bradycardia, hyperventilation, ultramestation seizure. So because you've blocked the, the mitochondria from functioning, now they're functioning entirely off of anaerobic metabolism. So what that means is their lactate is going to become profoundly elevated since that's all you got to work on, just like when you're running your 100 meter sprint and you don't have enough oxygen anymore, you start to produce lactate. The other thing is their pulse ox is going to be normal, like 100% normal. So classically, when I ask, especially medical students about cyanide, they'll be like, well, they're going to be hypoxic. No, they're not hypoxic. They can't use oxygen. So their oxygen's become elevated. There's the old cyanide antidote kit, which is amyl nitrate, sodium nitrite, and sodium thiosulfate. We won't get all the mechanisms. Almost always now we use hydroxocobalamin. Just know when you give hydroxocobalamin, this is a patient's urine after they got it. All of your colorimetric tests are going to be screwed up after you give this. So just be aware of it. Um, and their skin will turn this pink color. The bottle, when you pull it out of the package, will be that bright red color. EMS may give this pre-hospital. There's some cities now where EMS has that for like fire victims and stuff. Serotonin syndrome. So this one is important because do you know what famous law that impacted all of us, at least all of us younger people? And I know that's very relative when I call myself younger, but what law the serotonin syndrome had an impact on? Or maybe not law, I shouldn't say law. More uh, regulation, yeah, duty hour limitations. So this is where the 80-hour work week came from. So Libby Zion was a patient who was admitted. She was on phenylzine and she started developing tremors. It used, I don't know if people still use it, but it used to be people who used meparidine for tremors, for chills, gave her meparidine. What they didn't realize was clonus is what she was having. MAOIs obviously put you at risk for serotonin syndrome, so does meparidine, combine the two together. Most of the serotonin syndrome cases I've seen are a combination of pills. I have seen some where they just overdose over a single serotonergic agent, but it's usually a combo, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. 
So what do they get? They get alter mental status. This is a trifecta they need. Alter mental status, autonomic instability, which is usually tachycardia and hypertension, but it can be anything. And then neuromuscular hyperactivity. And the classic finding is I had a patient who on her exam, so I went and examined her. She was in a coma, unresponsive at that time, had been sedated because she'd become combative. Her upper extremities, uh, you move her upper extremities, they're completely normal. Everything's normal about her upper extremities. Her lower extremities push up on her foot and it was this clonus that would just not stop on indefinitely. And so that's classic serotonin syndrome. If they get too sick, they may go on to develop muscle rigidity, but most of the time they'll have this clonus much greater in the lower extremities than the upper extremities. And if you find that, you've confirmed your diagnosis. The answer on the test is often ciproheptadine. I don't give ciproheptadine, a lot of toxicologists don't because it can only be given PO. So you either need to mash it up and put it through an NG tube, or the benzos work just fine. You would always give the benzos, ciproheptadine would be an adjunct to that. And then most of these cases resolve within about 24 hours. So if you just sedate them with benzos for 24 hours, then you don't need to give the ciproheptadine. They've made a recovery if necessary. So when they get hyperthermic, it's because of all the muscle contraction. So if you can't get that under control of benzos, then you paralyze them and that way you've shut down that neuromuscular process um, and so that'll fix that. And then environmental cooling, if you get that far, they're still hyperthermic. So when they die, it's the hyperthermia that you worry about. And that's what happened with Libby Zion. I think her temp was like 107 um, before she went into cardiac arrest. NMS or malignant hyperthermia, and malignant hyperthermia, similar differences. NMS is caused by antipsychotics. That's how you tell the difference. Was it a serotonergic agent or an antipsychotic? You might not know by history. Lead pipe rigidity is more classic for NMS. Same thing. Benzos, intubate and paralyze if necessary. Dantrolene has been reported, and then environmental cooling. Malignant hyperthermia, that's due to general anesthesia or succinylcholine. For those patients, you give dantrolene, environmental cooling. There's actually a hotline. So call the Poison Center and they'll give you the national hotline for that and they'll help you walk you through the management for that one. Summary, we talked about general approach to the tox patient, what labs you want to get, salicylate and acetaminophen. Those are the two big labs you want to get. Everything else only get if it's indicated based on the exam. Urine drug screens are probably helpful in pediatric cases because most times they shouldn't be on anything to trigger it. EKG, looking for that QRS whining or QT prolongation or some of the dig effect, other things like that. Manage the airway, that's the biggest thing. Manage their cardiac dysrhythmias. Decontamination, most of the things are not indicated. Sometimes uh, activated charcoal is, but they need to be awake or they need to be intubated. We went through the toxidromes and then the specific drugs.